Before that, though, as America is once again apparently feeling threatened by the economic power of the wider world, remember Donald Trump has spoken of China as economically raping the US, we're going to look at a case from an earlier decade when an Asian power was viewed with suspicion, and it's a disturbing story of murder and bigotry. In June 1982, a young Chinese-American man, Vincent Chin, was beaten to death by two white men in Detroit. His killing and the lenient sentences the perpetrators received sparked an Asian-American activist movement with protests in cities across the US. Fahana Haider has been speaking to Helen Zia, one of the activists leading that fight for justice. justice. We want justice. We want On June the 19th, 1982, Vincent Chin, a 27-year-old engineer, was at his bachelor party in Detroit when he got into a fight with Ronald Ebens, an auto worker, and his stepson, Michael Nitz. Witnesses said the men mistook him for a Japanese person and used racial slurs. They were also said to have shouted, it's because of you we are out of work. Mr. Evans and Mr. Nitz jumped out from behind the truck, attempted to grab Vincent Chin. I identified myself as a police officer. I showed him a badge and an ID card. I had my weapon drawn. I asked him to drop the baseball bat. When we pulled up, we found that it was an oriental gentleman. His skull was obviously fractured, and uh, Chin was obviously in a fatal condition. He wasn't dead yet, but you know, from my experience of being on the street for so long, the man was a goner. Vincent was in a coma for four days and died on the 23rd of June, 1982. His funeral took place on what should have been his wedding day. In the early 1980s, the U.S. was in the grips of an economic depression, the unemployment rate was at its highest since World War II, and Japan was getting the blame. I can only describe it as mirroring the Islamophobia that poured out as a hysteria in America after 9-11, except instead of being against people who, you know, quote, look Muslim, back then it was anybody who looked Japanese. Helen Zia, a Chinese-American, had moved to Detroit in 1977. Asian Americans were largely invisible, were seen as foreign invaders, as though we were there to do harm to America. And 1982 was also a time of intense hatred against Japan, Japanese, and anybody who looked Japanese because of the economy and that we were to blame. Every time a newspaper came out or a, a news report on the radio or television, it would be just full of bile and fury toward people who look like us, the enemy. Choked by imports and fighting for survival, the American auto industry and its army have targeted Japan as a major source of its problems. We are being shot at and shot up by the Japanese, who have the most protectionist economy in the world. Japan was perceived to be flooding the U.S. with its cars, and this was felt particularly hard in Detroit, the car-making capital of America. So the depression in the United States, but the epicenter in Detroit, was incredibly bleak. And that was the climate when Vincent was killed. And Helen, when did you first hear about the death of Vincent Chin? I heard about Vincent Chin's death the same time most everybody else did. I read it in a newspaper. It was on the front pages of the Detroit Free Press. It had a picture of Vincent, his fiancée, and his mother. And in Detroit in 1982, there were so few Asian Americans. So seeing a picture of an Asian American who had been killed, that was a shock. You know, I'm Chinese American, as was Vincent Chin, but looking like he could be Japanese, just even walking on the street, anybody with an Asian face knew that they could be a target. Ronald Eben and his stepson, Michael Nitz, never denied killing Vincent Chin, but they insisted the matter was simply a barroom brawl that had ended badly and not a hate crime. They pleaded guilty to manslaughter and in March 1983, they were sentenced to three years probation and fined $3,000. The judge, when he pronounced the um, probation and fine, said that these are not the kind of men you send to jail. They are clean-cut men. They're not going to do this again. Basically, he was giving them a free pass to kill somebody, and in this case, a Chinese-American. I was enraged. I thought, I have to do something. One of the articles interviewed some representatives in the Chinese-American community, and I, as a young reporter, saw the names of the two Chinese Americans. And I called the two gentlemen up and I just said, I, I want to do something. What can we do? You know, I'm a journalist. 
I know a little bit about press conferences and things like that. How can I help? So they invited me to meet with them. And when I got there, there was a young Chinese-American lawyer named Lisa Chan. We hadn't seen any police records yet. The young attorney, Lisa Chan, who was there, briefed us about what legal options could happen. And we all agreed we needed to involve the community. We went from a meeting of four people to 10 people to 50 people. We formed an organization that we named American Citizens for Justice because we saw that it was beyond the Chinese community in Detroit, and that it needed to be broader. And we went up to having meetings of 300 people showing up in a big auditorium to actually talk about what could be done. This was the first time that Chinese Americans and Japanese Americans, it was the first time we had come together. They began to organize rallies and protests across the U.S., from New York to San Francisco. The 11.30 rally began with a list of speakers nearly a page long waiting to add their personal support and that of many organizations to the cause of justice for Vincent Chin. I am really grateful. We all will really hard to get justice for my son, Vincent. Their main demand was that there be a government investigation into Vincent Chin's death. And as a result of their activism, it was soon underway. Early 1984, the federal government announced that it would begin a federal investigation to see whether race had played a part in the killing of Vincent Chin. And how did you feel yeah. when, they, when that was announced, when, when they said that investigation would happen? I felt like we had overcome a great hurdle, that there was a governmental authority that actually said, OK, we're listening. We will look into this. This was an enormous validation of our humanity for the entire Asian American community in the United States. It was really a movement across America and beyond. Papers in Hong Kong and China and Japan were following this case. In 1984, federal prosecutors took Ronald Ebens and Michael Nitz to court for violating Vincent Chin's civil rights. Ebens was convicted and sentenced to 25 years in prison, but this victory was short-lived when, on May 1, 1987, the conviction was overturned on appeal. The feeling of that day when the not guilty verdict was announced was just, it was devastating and exacerbated just by the grief of Vincent's mother, who really had been a moral authority through the whole process, through all those years. She would say, our skin might be different, but our blood is the same. And the day that Vincent's killer was let off, she was heartbroken. And it was the hardest thing for me to have to say to Mrs. Chin, who I became very close with. She asked me, Helen, is, isn't there something more we can do? And I had to say to her, no, this was it. Despite the fact that Vincent's killers ultimately did not serve any jail time, Helen believes Vincent's death had a lasting impact on civil rights and the rights of immigrants in America. Vincent was an immigrant, and there was a question whether federal civil rights law would protect an Asian in America and an immigrant in America. And so the fact that the federal government took it up was an opening for all Americans. And now federal civil rights law protects on the issue of gender, sexual orientation, and a disability, and immigrants are protected. So I really think for all of Americans, there were many changes stemming from this Vincent Chin case that really affect all of us and really expanded the notion of what the value of human life is and how federal law should protect that. And so there's not a single person in America who was not affected by this, the killing of Vincent Chin and the activism that came out of it. Helen Zia, who remains an activist and award-winning journalist, now lives in California from where she was speaking to Fahana Haider.